Homeworking for me is a form of communication. It's a way of expressing the care that I feel for people. By caring for the wood, accenting its natural characteristics, and performing operations on it that are careful, I feel I am not only doing what I want to do, but satisfying others too. You may want to use this tape to build a project for yourself, but more than likely others will be getting enjoyment from it too. That's one of the nice things about building furniture. It's concrete. It's around long after you finish making it. You'll see in an hour here what normally takes me about 30 hours to do. But all the steps are here. A table is a good project to undertake. It's impressive when it's done, but it's not overwhelming to make. A project like this yields to orderliness and consistency, because in the end, the composure of the piece will reflect what you brought to it. Welcome to my wood shop and showroom on the Main Street in Berea, Kentucky. I'm Kelly Mailer. And this is the part of my shop where I show my furniture as well as some other crafts from area artists. In this video, I'm going to show you how I make a shaker table. Shakers are pretty well noted for their simple designs, their solid sturdy construction, tapered legs, generous overhang, and native hardwoods. This table I've made out of poplar. It's a prototype to the table that we're going to be making. And I built it in order to work out the details of the design. I decided to make it 30 inches wide and 4 foot long and 29 inches tall. It'll seat 4 people comfortably, which makes it a good size table for a small kitchen or a gaming table. Even though this is the most basic of table designs, there are many variations. For instance, this bird's eye maple table desk is built a little bit narrower, about 24 inches, convenient for reaching across. It has less of an overhang, that way you can have access to the drawers. And it's also built a little taller, which makes it more comfortable to sit at while you're working. The construction is basically the same, except that we've added two rails and a divider to support the drawers. I've made a number of these tables. Here's one in curly maple and another one in walnut. Another variation are these two mahogany bedside tables, not unlike this one up here on a different scale. Again, the construction is pretty much the same. It has the tapered leg, except here I've added a curve where it meets the rail. The top section of the leg remains square where the joinery takes place. You may notice how nicely the grain flows between these two drawers. The same happens in the other two. All four of these drawer fronts were cut out of the same board. And the same with the top. The top was cut out of one board, and so the grain matches, as you may notice here, while the lines flow together. I like to do this a lot in my furniture, and I'll be showing you more of that on the table that we'll be building. Even though these two tables will be sitting on two sides of a bed, when you walk into the room, they'll cohere. The last variation I have to show you is this cherry drop leaf table. It has a base like the other ones, the difference being, instead of a taper leg, we have a turned leg. We still have the apron and leg configuration with the leg being square for the mortise and tenon joints. It's much narrower and longer than the other ones we have, but basically it's the same. The drop leaf works on a rule joint. When it's up, you have two mating surfaces here. And when it's down, you don't see down through the joint. The leaf is supported by a gate leg it pivots on a knuckle joint, which is the same as a rounded finger joint with a pin in the center. In this configuration, the table seats six comfortably. You may notice the grain matching in the top. These boards came out of the same tree, and I've matched them symmetrically across the surface. So you can see, a table like this can lead to a lot of different possibilities. The first step is choosing your wood. This is the part of the shop where I begin doing my woodworking. I try to set up the whole shop with an eye toward workflow. I have my radial arm saw, my band saw, my joiner right here. 
in the racks, I've stored my lumber, tried to organize it according to the species, the thicknesses, and since I do so much matching in my furniture, I try and stack it how it was cut out of the trees. Um, one way that I accomplish this is by looking for clues in the end grain and the sides that tell me how the tree was cut, the boards were cut out of it. And I try to stack them accordingly. This really helps when it comes time to make furniture. Well, this is a lot of lumber for me, more than I'd use in a year or two. But even still, when I do particular projects, I have to go to the lumber yard and pick out what I need for that particular project. Actually, for this particular project, I had to go and find, look for some cherry. And I came up with a couple of boards here that I think will do for the project. And up here, we have some a quarter that I'll be using for the legs. What I did first was to make it to scale drawing. This helps in a lot of ways. One thing, it gives you different views of the table. We have here the overall size of the project, the top piece, the two side rails, the two end rails, the four legs, and the piece of wood that we're going to get our four corner blocks out of. Now that we have a pretty good idea of the parts that we need, let's go ahead and pull the lumber. Move this out of the way. I had picked these two cherry boards out at the lumber yard. I haven't had a chance to really look at them closely. Let's look at them now. I usually I usually keep this rack pretty clear so that way I can pull lumber out around and look it over closely. Okay, This is our first board. It's a little over 10 inches wide and looks pretty clear. It's got a very little bit of sapwood on either side that I think we can deal with. Um, from looking at the side I can see it doesn't go all the way through to the top. Here, the length of my board is a little bit over 10 feet long. So if we have a top that's 30 inches wide by four foot long, we want to cut this probably in two pieces, which means, let's just see for rough, we're talking about, about 50 inches to there and 50 inches to here which leaves us with 17 inches, which really there is no piece that's short. But here we have, for sure, we have two top pieces for our table, which is 20 inches. Let's look at our other board. This one's a little bit wider, same length. Okay, right off, I can see that it has a crack on the end. It comes quite a ways up the board, and then a knot here. The rest of it looks pretty clear on this side. What this makes me think about right away are my rails, which are four inches wide. Uh, you can see here you got plenty enough for four and plenty enough for four here, even with the sapwood over here. Um, let's look at some length. Our rails are 38 and 24 inches. If we came up here, let's say, gave us a little extra space for our 38 and went down with our four foot section for the top and go on from there and we end up with 30 inches which is more than enough for our 24 inch rails. So it looks like with these two boards that we have enough to do our top and our aprons on the table. Of course the uh, eight quarter stock is up here. Let's take a quick look at it and make sure that we have. It looks plenty big enough. I see some sap. You may notice that this cherry is just a little bit darker than this cherry. It's actually, I believe this wood has come from the same place. I like actually the idea of the legs being a little darker than the top. It seems to give it more stability, more weight at the bottom of the table. Uh, I wouldn't like it the other way around necessarily. My saw here, you can see, is an industrial grade three-phase machine. When I started my shop, I decided to get some heavy-duty equipment. I have the space for it. It really wasn't much more than what you'd pay for a new consumer price machine. It was around $600 is what it cost me. Uh, I can see now that we have a nice figure right here and a matching figure right over here. What I'm thinking is, is that if, if we can center those and make a cut in the middle, it's going to look real nice on the finished table.
With an extra 17 inches in the length of this board, I can pretty much center the cut where I want it. Now I'll mark the ends of these two top pieces for easy identification. Okay, let's take a look at this one now. See what we have. If you remember, we had the crack here, and we were thinking about our aprons. What I'm thinking is, is that instead of our end aprons, which are only about 24 inches long, which is going to keep us on this side of the knot, I want to do the longer aprons, which will take us past the knot. That'll make our top piece from here down, or toward the end down there, but with all the sap on the other end, I want to keep away from that as far as the top piece. For the aprons, four inch wide, we have enough room in here to get between this without having to worry about it. Not having as much extra length in this board, I have to stay pretty close to the end while I check for cracks. I'm going to cut an inch at a time until no more cracks appear. I'm not as concerned about the center crack because this is where I'm going to rip for my two side aprons. Now I'll mark the rough length of the side aprons. Make sure you keep your hands out of the way of the saw. Put these over by the bandsaw for ripping in a minute. I'm going to cut the last remaining top piece, which will leave our two short aprons on the end. You can see here that my radial arm saw is a little different than the conventional model. It has a large beam and a housing and eight bearings holding it. There are the three pieces for my top. By using my crack as a starting point, I make a mark down the center of the board, which I rough cut on my bandsaw, 1910 Oliver. I've outfitted it with new guides and put a guard over the blade and over the wheel. I generally run it with a half inch blade that four teeth per inch, both for ripping and for resawing. I'll rip my end aprons here as well. Then I can mill my top pieces and my aprons together. Now that we've cut our boards to rough length and ripped our aprons, we're ready for the next step in the operation, which would be to joint them. If you're interested in machines like I am, um, this here is a 12-inch Oliver joiner. I got this at a used machinery outlet up outside of Louisville for about $600 also. Okay, what we're going to do on the joiner is to flatten one face in preparation for running it through the planer. And we're going to smooth one edge so that way I have a straight edge when I run it against the fence on the table saw. Now the first thing I do is to look at the edge and determine which way the grain is going. And here I can see that it's coming out at this angle. So I want to run it in this direction over the joiner. If this board were any smaller, I would want to use a second push block. I want to make sure that the board is well past the cutter head and the guard is retracted before I reach for it. I can see here that the board is becoming flatter and one more pass should take care of it. The trick to using the joiner is to maintain a steady, even feed rate throughout the length of your board. Notice the stance that makes that possible. I marked the board to show which end I ran first. I put my jointed side against the fence to joint my edge. On this particular board, I've got a convex side here. What I want to do is run the other side, which is concave. This offers a lot more stability. And I just keep running it until the edge becomes flat. And now these boards are ready for the planer and the table saw. This is my planer. I call it Big Mama and you can see why. Uh, it weighs about 5,000 pounds, which was a little scary bringing it in with a forklift underneath it. Uh, this old building was a car dealership at one time and fortunately they reinforced the floor. It's a 24 inch planer. And even though it's a big machine, it basically runs the same as a smaller one does. You can see here with the pipe on top, I have it hooked up to a dust collector. Now let's set the planer to just cut a little bit. Okay. You remember the line that we drew on at the joiner, which showed us which direction the grain was coming out of the wood. If we ran it over the joiner like this, 
to take advantage of our dr grain direction, what we want to do now through the planer is have it flipped over so that it runs like this. This first pass with the jointed side down will give me my first look at the board as a whole. From here I can determine on which side to run through the planer next. I approach my finished thickness slowly This is less than a sixteenth of an inch. I mark each board for grain direction. Sometimes though, as in this case, I'm still experiencing tear out, so I'm going to run it in the opposite direction. By looking at each piece individually like this, I really get to know all the components of my project. Of course, if you don't have a planer, many lumber yards will mill your materials for you. Well, there's our top pieces and our aprons. As you saw when these came out of the planer, they were really beautiful. They match up very nice. I couldn't ask for any better. What we're going to do next at the table saw is to go ahead and make our edges straight. Usually what you want to do here is cut to the smallest end. Check this end. Okay. Move my guard over. This is not the guard that came with the saw. Well, I sure like it a lot. It uh, keeps my hands away from the blade and it's easy to take on and off, which I'll show you a little later. Okay, let's lower it a little bit. That's just right. Another advantage of this guard is that you can see your work down through it. At this point, I'm only interested in taking off a little bit and making the edges straight. I want to leave as much of the board here as possible so I have more options when it comes time for layout. I do the same thing on all three boards. With straight edges now we can uh, see how we can put our top together. We don't want to just take our boards and put them together any which way. We want to use them to their best advantage. Right off the bat, you remember we had these two boards out of the same piece of wood and they're a perfect match. Um, this one isn't, although it, they go together real nicely. But what I think I would rather do is put that one in the center, even it out a little bit. Now you may also remember on the ends of our boards that we marked which side was our heartwood side and which side was our sap side. You can see here we have the sapwood and at the other end we have the sapwood. I still like the other side better, so we're going to keep that side up. We'll have to remove the sap, especially if it's on the outside edge. Now let's see if we can get our joints to match real nicely. What we're looking for is that the grain goes together. We don't want to have, right, look right here where this grain is coming in at an angle and just dead ends here. This doesn't really meet up with anything in this other board. So right off, let's take the center board and switch it around. Well, that matches up really nice. The lines run right into each other. Uh, this is not working as well. Uh, we have straight lines, but they're not running together very good. Let's turn it around and see what other option we have. Now that is real nice. You can see here we've got straight grain, straight lines just running all the way down with a little flare out here. And this flare reminds me of this flare right over here. I think visually these boards would look real nice together at a tabletop. There is some color variation and cherry from experience I know that once we put a finish on this and the sun hits it a while it's going to even out. So I'm not as concerned about the color as I am with matching the grain. So I like this arrangement. Let's mark it. I believe we have plenty. Yeah, we have over an inch and a half before ripping off our sapwood and joining it for final glue up. I'm doing two things here. 
I'm finalizing our grain match as well as ripping to final width. If I were gluing together sub-assemblies, which are much easier to handle, I wouldn't be as concerned with the finished width. I've made a model here of the glue joint that I use. It's a spring joint, and the way that it works is, is that we've relieved the center more than the edges. So what happens mechanically when you press down in the center here and it puts more pressure on the outside where the joint is more likely to fail. One thing you want to be sure to be careful of, and this is exaggerated also, is that you don't have a joint that revolves in the center. What this indicates is, is that you have a high center and low on the outside here, which means that you're going to have a failed joint. The way that you set this up on the joiner is to raise your outfeed table just a hair higher than the knives, the cutting arc of the circle. When the board is coming through, it lifts it up, cuts a minute arc in the center of the board and a little less at the ends. The other concern to make a good glue joint is to make sure that your fence is square to the table. And just in case the uh, fence on the joiner is not square, I mark them in and out one side against the fence, one side away from the fence to compensate for any deviation in the 90 degree angle. Hand placement is especially important. We want to be able to maintain an even steady feed throughout the cut. We're using one hand to hold the board against the fence, the other to maintain steady pressure down. Any deviation in our movements here will show up in our glue joint. Here you hear the boards grabbing on the end, which is what we want. And the center is just barely relieved. Well, that's just right. Glue up can be an anxious time, so you want to be as prepared as possible. What I've got here is paper laid on my bench as well as on the battens that are going to be supporting our top. The surface is level as well as flat. It's important to be well organized. I'm using yellow glue here, which I spread using my finger, which seems to work better for me than any glue spreader that I've used. I apply it to both surfaces, which allows me a little more assembly time. As I put the boards down, I rub them back and forth together. This spreads the glue out more evenly, and you can feel them pull together. I start clamping from the center out with just a minimal amount of pressure, alternating between top and bottom clamps, all the while feeling to make sure that I have them level. You'll notice the ends aren't matched evenly across here but our marks are matched so we know that the boards are positioned the way that we originally laid them out for optimum grain matching. Here I'm tapping the boards to level them. You need some clamp pressure on it otherwise it, they would swim out of place but you don't want too much otherwise they won't move. You want to go down and have even pressure. You don't want so much pressure that you starve the joints. Use warm water to clean up the glue for the sandwich boards. I'm going to place these on both ends and in the center. These boards will further ensure a flat top.
This may look like a lot of clamps, but you know what they say, you never have enough. You want to use warm water to clean up your glue as soon as possible. It's a lot easier to clean it up now than it is later. This is one of two boards that I've cross cut out of our eight quarter stock. I'm joining one face and an edge like I did on the top boards in preparation for planing and ripping. I'll get two legs out of each board. Okay, what I've done here is I've went ahead and ripped the pieces that we joined for the legs. I've marked them so that way I can keep track of how they came and were cut out of the board, which is going to help us later when we go to make our mortises for the table. Our next step is to joint them square. Check my fence for square. Looks good. Remember, we're going to be building our joints from these surfaces. So it's imperative that they're square. Any deviation is going to show up in our finished product. I mark them both for the feed direction and the square corner. From these surfaces, we'll plane them to our finished thickness. And here I cut to length. What we're going to do now is cut the mortises in our legs. We have them set up here the way that they were cut out of the two boards. Now, I don't want to just put the mortises in the legs anywhere. So what I'm doing is moving them around to see where I can do it uh, to their best advantage. This is how we cut them out of our two boards. Now ideally you would just take them like this and move them apart and you would have a good match in your legs. Um, the problem with that is that I have defects in the bottom or what I chose to be the bottom of this board. I have one there on the outside and one here on the inside. Also I discovered that I have a pretty flecked pattern on the insides of my leg, which I'd rather have on the outside of the table. So what I've decided was is to take the boards and to switch them around like so. Okay? This affords me two uh, advantages. One, my taper, which I'm going to have on the two inside surfaces, will take away my defects here and here. Also, I get my fleck on the outside. I guess there's three advantages. And the other is that my grain is running here the same way that my taper will be running, which was going to make it much nicer. It's the, the grain will not be opposing my taper if I had it this way. On my other two legs, they came out the board like this. So basically, I have the same considerations that I had on my first two legs. My fleck pattern is on the inside, so now we want it on the outside. My grain pattern is going to come down and follow the same lines as the taper. When I put these four together now, what I've done is I've marked the tops of them for, so I will know where to mortise them. We have left and right back, left and right front. I've made corresponding mortise marks on the tops that I carry down on the faces of my boards to show me where my mortises are going to go. I normally cut my mortises on a pin router and I'll show you that momentarily. Since it's not a very common tool in shops, I've set up a plunge router and we'll do the first pair this way. The only layout lines I need on my mortises are the length, how far it's inset, and which side the mortises go on. The way that I determine this is I take my apron, remember it's four inches, and we make a light mark down here. And then I come up here for a shoulder, which is about a quarter of an inch. It's just enough to cover the mortise. And at the top, coming in about three-eighths of an inch to give me more strength at the end grain. To determine the inset of my mortise, I use my apron. And I set it in about an eighth of an inch, which isn't critical. Now, I know we have a three-eighths inch mortise. Okay? I know we have a three-quarter inch rail. Now that leaves me with three sixteenths of an inch shoulder on either side. So if I take my eighth inch inset 
and add my 3 16 inch shoulder. I use this line to set up my router fence. Let me show you what I've come up with. I use the device on my bench which has good flat um, wooden rails in there and I take three legs, set them in here, take the one with the mark on it, and put it in the middle. What this gives me is a good flat surface to rest my router on. I want to come out a little further with these so I get stability out here on the end. Clamp them together. And let's set up the fence to the mark. There it is. I have my depth set up for one inch and I'm going to cut it in three increments. I really like the slow start feature of this router. You can really notice it when you're using larger bits. I'm going to the line. My second cut. You can hear when you reach the end. And with a good stance you have a good grab on the router so you can guide it up against the fence and you can see your lines as well. On my second mortise, which is offset to the other side, rather than repositioning the fence on the router, all I really need to do is to move the router to the other side of this setup. Now I'm on the bench side routing. I've turned the turret in the wrong direction, which has caused the bit to cut too deeply as you can hear. And now I need to go back into corners and clean up where I missed. This machine is one of the most versatile in my shop, I feel. It's my overarm pin router. I use it for so many things. It's uh, it's invaluable to me. The way that it works, and the reason they call it a pin router is because you can take various size pins, here's three here and I've made other ones, that fit right in a holder centered with the router bit. This is one of many jigs that I use on the pin router. Um, I brought it out to show you how it works. I've cut out a, um, a recess in the bottom of the jig. This is for a handle that I use for a box lid. You clamp her on here and you, what you do is you take the jig and you set it down on top of the pin, put your bit in the router, plunge it into the piece and move it around and it'll follow whatever pattern is underneath the jig. As you saw the table travels up and down. It does it by means of a pedal here traveling on dovetail ways. It has a locking mechanism here to keep the table where you want it. It also has a hand wheel here to adjust the tabletop once you're at the end of your travel, as well as a locking knob that can lock it anywhere in between. Right now I have it set up for mortising. We have a fence here that I've got clamped. I've set the distance of the fence to the mortise by using this mortise. Now if I didn't have the mortise already I would set it up just like I did on the plunge router, but since we have the mortise I want to make sure that they match. For the depth, we adjust the hand wheel here, again, till it comes down to the bottom. Normally, I would put a mark on the end of my leg and come down to the mark. We're ready to route. The principles here are basically the same as they were using the plunge router. Here, by pushing down on the pedal, I'm lifting the table up into the bit. I take two or three passes until the table reaches its stop. As on the other legs, with the mortise being on the other side, instead of resetting my fence, I go to the other side of the router. Notice the feed direction is the same though. This view shows the lines that I'm cutting to. And the third pass is the bottoming cut, and you can see where the two tenons will meet. The 
first step in sizing the aprons, as with the boards that compose the top, is to straighten an edge and make the board parallel. Remember, I'm working from an edge that we straightened at the joiner. Now my next concern is, is to rip these so that I get rid of my defects, but still keep it as close as I can to the pretty grain. Since we just ripped this one, I know really by looking at it that all I need to do is move my fence over a little bit and that's going to take care of this. On this piece, we'll need to measure and see what it's going to take. I can see that it's just a little less than five inches. And if you remember our check up here, it comes down to here. A little less than five will get rid of this as well. To summarize, by tapping the fence over, we're able to remove the defects while keeping the pretty grain. These kinds of decisions are typical. You start out with more material than you need and you want to utilize the best parts of it. Lastly, I set my fence to the four inch width and run all my pieces. What I've done here was set up a little jig, a little cutoff jig for cutting off my rails to length. One thing that I like about this jig is that I can cut the first end square without it getting in the way. And then I use this end to register against the jig. It's critical that these pieces are the same length, otherwise my table won't be square. It's also critical that the cut itself is square since I'll be registering off this surface to cut the shoulders. Notice the shape that provides one point contact. This jig can easily be adjusted to various lengths, and of course if need be, you can make one longer. This is a scrap piece from one of my end aprons so I can use it on my router set up here to size the tenon to fit in the mortise okay? as well as the depth of cut to my shoulder a little less than one inch which matches the mortise that I have here. My router setup is nothing more then the plunge router you saw earlier attached to a piece of plastic dropped in this piece of plywood. I have the whole top sitting in one of my 55 gallon drums and I've cut out a little door so I can get in to make adjustments. For a switch, I have a foot pedal here that I use to turn it on and off with. Now that I have it set up, let me go ahead and cut the tenons. I cut this tenon in two passes since I'm using a three-quarter inch bit. I do it by making the first pass away from the fence and the second pass right up against the fence. I use a backing board held firmly against the apron to minimize tear out at the end of the cut. You can see this router method is considerably safer than cutting tenons on a table saw and you get good clean results. On the pin router we have to adjust our setup as well. Here I've got my final cut, I believe. Cut both sides. And test the fit. Since this is a beefier machine, I feel confident in using a larger bit, which actually cuts the tenon in one pass. I need to remove the frayed fibers since the cut is being keyed from the opposite surface. 
If this surface isn't flat on the table, I'll get a tenon that's too thin. The next step in our process is to taper the legs. We put our taper on the two inside surfaces where the mortises are, leaving the top section where the apron enters square. The reason that I taper only on the inside instead of both the inside and the outside is that I feel like that would give the table more of a pigeon-toed look. We have nice linear lines coming up straight and plumb to the top. I have two samples here of tapers. The maple one on your right is tapered to three quarters of an inch while this cherry one is tapered to one inch. Even a quarter of an inch makes a big difference in the look of the leg. I use a lighter leg on a smaller piece or a more refined piece such as a hall table. A heavier leg like this would be more appropriate for a larger table or a work table. I'm heading for something in between these two, not much unlike the one that I have here on the mock-up. There are a number of ways to do tapers. The way that I do it is on the joiner and it only involves putting a stop block at the foot of the leg. This causes the cutter to come in and start cutting about an inch below where the apron is. I've got the table set up to cut eighth of an inch cuts, so I'll only have to take about five passes to get down to the taper that I want. Notice that the leg is against the stop block before I start and the push block is in position. You want to keep your hand well in front of the cutter head. You want to be careful not to push down on the front of the leg otherwise it will lift up the back of the leg. Good fit. I really like the way that uh, woodworking flows around the shop. You know, at the, f at the beginning you have uh, your rough wood and your rough machinery, which is loud, and uh, you're, sh you're busy shaping the pieces to their final uh, dimensions. And after you finish all of that, you get to your bench where you can actually start doing handwork, and uh, that's where we are now. We're fitting the joints together. We're making our tenons fit the mortises. Since I fit each tenon to uh, an individual mortise, I like to pay attention to my grain orientation and try to mark them accordingly. And this is what I've done here. Uh, you can see on the tops of these, I've marked here the left front and left back. The other thing that I'm concerned about, of course, would be what's going to be on the outside. And I've marked them accordingly, as well as the top of the board. The reason I'm concerned with the top of the board is because here you can see we have a lot of visual grain activity going on at the bottom of the board which would be lost under the overhang of the table if I were to turn it upside down like this. You can see here the same thing is going on in this one. Once I know which way my boards are oriented I can match up my tenons with my mortises. I do that by bringing the tenon over to the mortise making a pencil mark. And then it's just a matter of removing the waste with a saw and a chisel. I like using a Japanese back saw. It gives me nice smooth thin curves. I use my thumb to keep the saw straight. And I cut a little above the shoulder because I can get a cleaner cut with my chisel. After I get the shoulder flat, I pair the corners. Then I check for flatness with the edge of my chisel. 
Now I round the tenons with cloth back sandpaper, cleaning up what's left over at the bottom. Lastly, I chamfer around the top of the tenon, more heavily on the inside where the two tenons will meet inside the leg. I do this for every joint. What I'm doing now is preparing my surfaces before I glue them up. It's a lot easier to do that here on the bench than it is after everything is all together. The way that I do it is a combination of two tools, my jointer plane and my hands cabinet scraper. I find that using these two tools will give me a good flat smooth surface. A lot better actually than sanding, although I can't get away from sanding and I have to do at least some. Some of the things I'm trying to get rid of in my wood right now are things like this divot created by the joiner when I was making my taper. You see it on both sides here. As well as the mill marks running up and down the leg. And any other imperfections that might be in the wood. One place I don't mess with is up here in the square section where my mortise and tenons fit. I don't want to compromise this joint any. I want a good tight fit. I have the same considerations on my rails. I have mill marks and various uh, imperfections on each piece. On the insides, I do hand plane them, but that's all. You see these slots in the top of the piece. I cut them in my pin router, but you can do the same thing with a hand router and a fence. What they're for are, I've also made some wooden buttons that fit into these slots, as you can see here. What they do is, is that from underneath, I screw these up into the tabletop and this holds it down to the base. The slots are to allow the wood to move back and forth. You know, a large surface like that is going to expand and contract. On my end, uh, side rails, I have the same slots you can see here. And instead of moving back and forth, what you get here is movement in and out. The way that I cut them is by taking a piece of wood, in this case it happens to be a wide piece off of our tabletop, and you can run it over a router like so, cutting your rabbit across the end. From there I take it to the table saw and slice it to length, and then I take a backing board on my miter gauge and cut the width. Drill them and countersink them and they're ready to go. We have three more pieces to do. These are done. This is one of many stages in building a piece of furniture where you perform repetitious tasks on a number of pieces. When I build a chest of drawers, I could be doing something like this all day. There's a benefit. What you're aiming for is consistency. How you arrange your pieces, your tools, and yourself all contribute to this. In sanding, I want to make especially sure that the ends of the boards are smooth where the joints meet. And lastly, I break the edges. Good joints. This is what I call dry fitting. I don't want any surprises when I go to put my glue on and start clamping them up and find out that something doesn't fit right. The things that I'm using here for glue up are of course my glue, clean up water, rags and brush, some clamp blocks, my clamps, a couple of boards to actually have the assembly sit on, and, and a dead blow hammer.
I use liquid hide glue which affords me more assembly time and is also reversible. I care about the longevity of my piece and it's not unusual in the long life of a piece of furniture for it to require repair. We want to keep that in mind. I'm going to take a lot of care during assembly to make sure that my pieces are square. Here we do that by aligning the apron with the top of the leg. In a linear piece like this, any deviation at the top is going to really be exaggerated at the bottom. I use two clamps here to control the pressure at the top and the bottom of the joint. Minimal pressure at first. Here I'm checking for flatness across both my legs. If I see any twist here, I can raise or lower my clamps until the legs are in the same plane. To check for square, we just use a stick with a pencil mark and see how it compares. By adjusting the pressure on either clamp, you can get it right where you want it. Perfect. Well, these have had plenty of time to dry. It's a fun part seen your project come together. Now we can see some of the fruits of our labor, the match of our pretty grain. Of course one of the best ways it matches is going to be across the front here. Now I've dry fitted my side rails just like I did with the end pieces and uh, everything fits real good so we should be able to go ahead and glue it together. Here I've already glued my long rails to my first sub-assembly I have it on the floor. We have the same considerations here with squareness. And we're careful to line up the tops of the rails with the tops of the legs. Once it's together, I can stand it up. And again, I'll be pulling the joints together with two pipe clamps. Here I check for square by making a mark on a piece of wood at the top and at the bottom and correct any splay by adjusting the clamps. Now we'll check the inside for square by using two sticks which we'll also mark with a pencil. You can see here it's just a little off, which we can fix by using a long clamp across the long diagonal. Just a little bit of pressure will bring it to where it belongs. Now we'll check it once more. And it's right. Before I walk away from this, I like to clean up all the glue. I've just joined in both edges of our tabletop to get rid of any clamp marks and also to make sure that they were the right size and parallel. What I've got here is a cutoff setup that I made to cut off various size wide pieces. Um, I've moved my table saw around 
one nice thing about having a wood floor. I've moved it in, in conjunction with my router table. This way when I push it off of my table saw, it catches it here on this table. What we're going to do is cut off our end square and to length. We're aiming for 48 inches. We have close to 52. That gives us plenty of space to cut away from the ends where the joint is the weakest. I usually look at the panel now to see if there's any uh, defects or figure that I want to remove or keep on one end or the other. Looking at this one, I see it looks pretty equivalent. So I think I'll just cut off about two inches on each end. This is going to help hold this panel down as I slide it out over the end of the table. I'm going to line up my mark with uh, my saw curve in the jig. By now, I've repositioned that block tight against the tabletop so it will not move. I have to raise the saw blade into the tabletop because of its width. Otherwise, I would have to start with it almost off of the saw. Lower the blade all the way so I can reposition the other end on the jig. And here I cut to length. I find this jig practical, but I have cut panels, especially wider ones, by rough cutting with a handsaw and trimming with a router and fence combination. I'm working on the top now, and one of the considerations I have left is the treatment of the edge. I've made four samples here that will give us a chance to look at different effects. Let me show you what I've come up with. First one I have here is called a thumbnail molding. It has a ledge and a heavy round over. This is a much more traditional one, I think, than fits with the table, although it could work. This heavily chamfered one is, has a little more modern look to it. It tends to give the top a thinner look because you basically see the flat edge and not the undercut edge. The third one is a simple one also. It has a slight round over on the top edge and just a bare round over on the bottom. This one tends to keep the full thickness of the top that we started out with. I like it because it's going to relate real well with what I intend to do to the base uh, edges, which is just a slight round over, just breaking the edges. The last one that I've done is a bullnose. This is heavily rounded, evenly on the top and the bottom. It's a nice edge treatment. Um, if I were going to use it, I would definitely want to round over the pieces of my base more. The way that I have it now, it doesn't really go with it. There's nothing else for the, um, the arc to relate to. We're going to choose this one for our table, and I've set up the router to make the cuts. I've already slightly rounded the bottom edge and now I've changed the depth for a heavier cut around the top. You can see here how the light plays off of these new surfaces. Careful around the corners. This is a 3 8 inch roundover bit. Now that that's done, we can take care of our surface here. You can see it needs some work on it. We've got some pipe clamp marks, a little bit of a ledge, mill marks on it. Now normally a lot of people would just take their belt sander at this point and start sanding away. I don't like to do that because that tends to obscure the wood rather than reveal it. I've got my trusty joiner plane here that I try and keep good and sharp and with this I'm going to start the first step of smoothing and flattening the surface. The plane's partner is definitely the workbench, which holds the work securely and at the right height. I went the first couple of years of my woodworking career without a good workbench, and when I got this one, which came from an old chair factory, I really appreciated it. You can see I've planed the bottom already. The shavings are a bit heavy here, but the plane was cutting so well, 
and I had these stains to remove, but I didn't readjust it. Listen to the difference in the cut. This is my cabinet scraper. It's a Stanley 8.0, and I use this for my final smoothing of my surfaces. It produces a much finer shaving than my hand plane, which is here, and here is my cabinet scraper shaving. Let me show you how uh, to sharpen it over at my sharpening area here. The blade is held in with two screws. You always want to take it out the bottom. On the back side here, the bottom edge is filed at a 45 degree angle. That um, edge is then bent over, uh, burnished over to a 15 degree angle. It's just like a hand scraper, except that it's in a body, which makes the sharpening a little more critical. A hand scraper, as you already know if you use one, you can move it up and down to find the best cutting angle. This blade is performing real well, so let's not mess with it. Move it aside. I have another one here. The first step is to bevel this at 45 degrees. I use a very smooth file to do this. Critical things you want to keep in mind are get, keeping this as flat as possible across the top. You certainly don't want it to be coved out this way and you want to uh, minimize any kind of crown to it. So uh, in this instance you want to have it straight across. When you work up a burr on the back, you want to remove it. And here I use a water stone. It's about 800 grit. And I lay it flat on here. Now you could remove it with a file, but I find that I get much better results when I use a flat stone. I think it's smoother and I think the file, even with a smooth file, puts in little nicks uh, in the edge. And these tend to show up in your final cut. We've gotten rid of our burr here. The next step is to sharpen the 45, smoothing out on the stone to remove the file marks that we put on there. You hold it at a 45. One good way to teach yourself to hold it at a 45 is to give yourself direct feedback. There are file marks on there when you start out and when you start stoning it you'll be able to see them disappear and where you're sharpening. If you're sharpening too much on the heel, you know that you have it too far down. And if you're sharpening too much on the toe, you know you have it too far up. So in the beginning stages, I think it pays to keep looking at it. That's good. You remove the burr by turning it over. That's got it. After you remove the burr, the wire edge, the next step lay it down on a surface. What we're going to do here is consolidate the metal on the back. A touch of oil here works good. What this actually does is it, it moves the metal right toward the edge and, and makes almost a little ball that gives the hook support. This helps to keep your hook lasting much longer. That's plenty. The next step is to burnish the edge. What you do here is to take it at 45 degrees again, is where you start. And you push against it, and then you start coming over more and more until we end up, this here would be zero degrees, this here would be 15 degrees. This is where we're gonna end up at 15 degrees. So let's go. Well, that's quite a burr. I don't know if you can see it there, but you can certainly feel it and hear it. A 
from here, you put it back in your scraper body from the bottom again. Let me show you how you adjust it on the tabletop. It's loose in here. What you want is it to be on a flat surface. Tighten these up hand tight. What you're looking for is it for it to just a slight grab on the wood, like so. You want to make sure that your thumb screw is backed out. You don't want it pressing against the blade during this part of the operation. Make sure they're snugged up good. Okay. Now from here, the thumb screw works just like your thumbs do when you press a cabinet scraper. Uh, when you have a newly sharpened blade, really all you're looking for is some support on the back of the blade. You're not really trying to flex it there. As the blade dulls, you give it more and more thumb screw. And that's all there is to it. You're ready to cut. Some nice scrapings. Now I need to finish scraping out my top and prepare it for finishing. I have a few processes left to do on the base and then we can bring them both together. I've rough milled some heavy stock for our corner blocks. I've set the miter gauge at 45 degrees and attached a board with some emery cloth on it to hold the stock as I run it through the saw. The masking tape provides an index so I can cut the pieces at the same length. I lay out a notch for the legs and a contour which makes drilling for the screws much easier. This is my small bandsaw, a 10 inch craftsman. I need to make these relief cuts in order to execute the curve. Here I clamp the corner blocks to the bottom of the apron where I can get more stability. My taper bit drills and countersinks in one operation. With a little bit of beeswax, I attach the corner blocks. I don't feel glue is necessary. This is the bit with which I'll drill the holes for the pegs. I use it to set up my table saw. First the fence to the teeth, and then the height, just a little less than the bit. By using two push sticks, I can cut my pegs first on the side and then the edge. It leaves just enough wood to keep them in place until I snap them off. Instead of measuring for each peg position individually, I've made a template. Check the depth of cut to make sure that it goes through the tenon. This detail finalizes the joint, both visually and structurally. This is an eighth inch chisel I'm using to square my holes up. I'm doing it freehand, although you could use a square to mark it out. It would be much easier to use a dowel, but I don't believe that would go with the table at all. Rounding the end of the peg makes it drive easier. You can hear when the peg bottoms out. We saw these a little above the surface. You could use a contrasting wood, but you can see as I slice the peg, there's plenty of contrast here. As the wood ages, this will become more subtle. Time to set the base on the top. Centering it becomes a lot easier when you use two combination squares. I 
I mark each corner to record its proper position. That way, if the table base gets moved accidentally, or when I move it to drill for holes, I can put it back where it belongs. And then I mark for the pilot holes. You can see I've attached my top to the base. If you look down between the wooden buttons, you'll see a space. We do this by setting the slot down a little lower than the thickness of the button. This way, when you tighten the screw, it cinches the top down to the base. Before I attach the top, I finish the two parts separately. By breaking the edges lightly, it makes it more friendly to feel. Also, it helps it not to dent. I chamfered the feet pretty heavily with sandpaper, so that way when you drag it across the floor, it doesn't chip out. I even round it over underneath the apron, so when people feel under here, it's not harsh and unfriendly. I sanded it all down with 150 sandpaper and gave it a light coat of oil. Let me show you what it looks like. You can see how nicely our match worked out. This does have a light coat of oil on it, like I said. Now to me, the first coat of oil is the first step in my finishing process with lacquer. Of course, the table could be finished out in any number of ways. As I mentioned earlier about defects, there's not a project that comes in my shop that starts at the lumber pile and comes through the door of the showroom that isn't without some kind of a surface problem. This first one here was a fairly deep gouge I believe happened at the lumber yard before we ever got the board, although it never came out in the milling process. Nice and smooth now and it kind of matches the natural blemish over here. And over here I ran into a few surface checks that I filled in to match the other mineral deposits that naturally occur in cherry. Not to be showing all the defects, but I did run into a few just like anybody would. This one happened at the router when I was droughting my tenon. The uh, edge of the apron chipped out. This looks a little dark now, but as the table ages, it'll blend right in. Let me show you how I handle a couple of these common surface defects. I have a board here that the video crew was so kind to vandalize for us. It has a dent, a tear out, and a chip missing off here. If you're lucky enough to find the chip, you can tape it on your project and glue it on later. If you can't find it, one thing that I do is, is to take the jagged surface and go ahead and flatten it out to make a joint. Now you can join a piece of wood to this flat surface. Ideally you want something to match perfectly and that's one reason why I routinely save my cutoffs for my project. They can come in extremely handy for cases such as this. Let's deal with our gouge next. I like to use five minute epoxy. It's good and tough. It's clear when it starts out. Put in two parts, pretty equal. I've got some cherry sawdust here I save from the sander. I usually keep a cup of it around. Bring in my sawdust and then just mix it up. Get a little bit of epoxy build it up a little higher so it can settle down in there. What happens with epoxy is it's a little bit rubbery and you can come in with a chisel and cut it before it gets rock hard. And then you can sand it up later as it gets harder. Do you remember the mineral deposits we had in the top? These are actually so dark it might be better to use a darker sawdust such as walnut or ebony. Another thing you can do with this mixture, when you have a problem like this on the edge, you can take some masking tape and build up a little wall little receptacle to put your epoxy in. The last defect we have to talk about now is the ding. Now this basically is just compressed fibers and sometimes you can be real successful in bringing them back but just adding some warm water. And if you need to, you can use a damp cloth and an iron to bring it along further. Fifteen years ago, when I first started woodworking, I was much more concerned with uh, the basics. Joinery, handling my machines and hand tools. 
It wasn't until I got comfortable with these that I was able to go on and shift my attention to other things such as unity and detailing. Wherever you are in your woodworking, I hope this tape has been helpful. Here are scenes from the Taunton Press video workshops featuring fellow enthusiasts. <laughs> Dovetail a drawer and making mortise and tenon joints with Frank Klaus. Repairing furniture and refinishing furniture with Bob Flexner. Radial arm saw joinery with Curtis Erpelding. Bowl turning with Dell Stubbs, and also Turning Wood with Richard Raffin, a third tape with Klaus, wood finishing, carving, techniques and projects with Sam Bush and Mac Headley, chip carving with Wayne Barton, router jigs and techniques with Bernie Moss and Michael Fortune. Making kitchen cabinets with Paul Levine. Small shop tips and techniques with Jim Cummins. And the three part series, tiling floors, tiling walls, and tiling countertops with Michael Byrne. <laughs>